I want to welcome everybody to the theory and practice of motivational interviewing, practicing ORs, mastering the core skills of motivational interviewing. My name is Paul Warren and I am the Deputy Executive Director of NDRI USA and I'm also the Director of the Training Institute and I'm very happy to uh, be sharing this training on motivational interviewing. This is basically an excerpt, uh, a condensed version of the training that I had the opportunity to do twice in Dallas with the staff face to face at six hours at a time. Now you may have noticed at the beginning of this webinar and as we go through that uh, you see these photographs. These are original photographs which I actually took uh, so basically, we're going to take a journey together into motivational interviewing. Our work together tonight really is to review and go over motivational interviewing spirit, the four processes of motivational interviewing, and I also, even though this is a one-hour webinar, I want to provide a practice opportunity to enhance mastery of the core skills of motivational interviewing, and those core skills are otherwise called ORs, and I will break that down as we go forward. So really this is what we're going to focus on tonight in this one hour that we have together, and hopefully going forward uh, we'll get to do additional work on this, possibly face-to-face -face or through future webinars. So here's our first poll. I'm going to launch this, and I'm going to ask you to elaborate. Oh, I'll tell you also, this picture is taken in Wheatland, Wyoming. I went there on a construction project. I volunteered to help build a house, and I have photos that will be upcoming in regard to that. And I felt that that was appropriate because basically what we're doing together is we're going to be building a foundation that you can actually use in your work uh, with the uh, consumers, clients, participants of your programs. So on a scale of one to five, how much do you use MI in your current work? And I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll, but uh, really only one computer uh, is going to be able to respond to that. So you might want to take a general poll in the room, or you can simply type your response is in. So if people call out a one, type a one, a three, a five, whatever they type in, you can type that in the chat window. So I'll leave both of these open so you can give me a sense of how much are you using motivational interviewing in your work. Now I know that many of you at this particular point are not as familiar with MI, so three people may be more um, able to answer this question than others. But go ahead and have somebody respond to the poll electronically using your mouse and then type in other responses and we'll just get a sense of how people are using MI in their work or if they're using MI in their work. So I'll leave the poll open just a little bit longer to see if anyone responds by mouse to that. Okay, I have a, a four somebody typed in, so they're using MI often in their work, okay. Any other responses from other people in the room? And again, you if, if it's not at all, just shout out a one. Got a, a, a three, so sometimes, excellent. I'm wondering, other people in the room, my understanding is there's 22 of you in the room. So out of the 22 of you, Show of hands, how many of you are not using motivational interviewing at all? Go ahead and raise your hands, not your electronic ones, your physical ones, right now, and whomever is typing in will do a quick count, just so I can get a sense of that. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll because it seems like taping or typing in is probably the best, and I'll share the results. So nobody actually voted through the electronic poll. That's fine. You're typing in numbers. It's perfectly okay. So I'm getting a sense maybe that the people that know about motivational interviewing are using it sometimes or often in their work and other people aren't really sure at this particular point. So let's move forward and kind of break down what it is we're talking about when we're talking about motivational interviewing. 
So first and foremost, when you think of MI, you can think of it as a client center. So many people, it's according to what somebody just typed in, are not really sure if they're using motivational interviewing or not. My hope is, is that at the end of this webinar, you will have a pretty clear picture of whether you are indeed using it or you're not. And maybe if we have time, you'll be able to respond and let me know that. So when we think of motivational interviewing, we really can think of it as a client-centered, and that means that we're there to meet the client's needs, we focus on what the client is presenting to us and their needs. It's a client-centered guiding method of communication. Now, I'm going to add something here. It's not on the slide, but I want to add it, which is that when you think of motivational interviewing, there are a couple of things I want you to always keep in mind. First and foremost, is listening. So I like this phrase, a guiding method of communication. We are listening to what our clients are telling us and we're listening in a very particular way. So a guiding method of communication and counseling to elicit, to draw out or to pull out and strengthen intrinsic motivation for change. Now, basically that is the heart of what MI is. It's drawing out from the person, the participant, the client, the patient, their intrinsic motivation for change. Not your best ideas about why they should change. Their intrinsic motivation to change. And our job using MI is to strengthen their internal motivation. And again, we, we draw this out. We strengthen it by exploring and resolving ambivalence. Now, the first thing I said I wanted you to remember when you think of motivational interviewing is what? And somebody type it in, please. What is the first thing I asked you to remember about motivational interviewing? So you think of MI and you associate what? Somebody type it in. Shout it out in the group. What is the first thing I asked you to remember? Change, no, actually it wasn't change. It was, yes, it's listening, absolutely. Now, I really appreciate whomever shouted out change because change is ultimately what motivational interviewing is. It's a way to help people change their behaviors. But first and foremost, I want us to think about listening. The second thing I want us to think about is ambivalence. Now, can somebody tell whoever is typing what is a good definition of what ambivalence is? What does ambivalence actually mean? So go ahead and type that in. What does ambivalence mean? Because listening, ambivalence, and change are probably the three things that you want to walk away from this webinar thinking about. Okay, so unju unjudgmental meaning that we want to have an, a non-judgmental or an unjudgmental attitude, absolutely. But what does ambivalence actually mean? If someone's ambivalent, what are they? How would somebody describe that? Any thoughts, any ideas about that? What does ambivalence really mean? I'll give it another few seconds and then I'll sort of throw out a working definition. That they are unaware. Actually, when somebody is ambivalent, they are aware. So they're in what Prochaska and DiClemente stages of change, the trans theoretical model, would call that they're contemplators. So they are actually aware if they're ambivalent. Ambivalence really means they're on the fence. They want to stop smoking, but they want to continue smoking at the same time. Ambivalence means that they're holding these two things at once. Now, listening and ambivalence are why MI was created. MI was created to help people change their behaviors and work through, explore, and resolve their ambivalence. Okay? Basically, there are a few primary goals to minimize resistance, and, and resistance can be looked at as sustained talk and discord, elicit change talk, and I'll explain what change talk is as we go forward, but again, it's, it's connected to that, that paragraph above about pulling out, drawing out, not pulling, but drawing out, tapping into sort of a person's intrinsic motivation to change, exploring and resolving ambivalence, we already talked about that, and nurturing hope 
and confidence. These are the primary goals of using motivational interviewing, which is this guiding method of communication and counseling. Okay? And again, the thing to keep in mind too, and again, I don't know who said it in the room, but I'm giving you a big thumbs up over here in New York City, is that change, motivational interviewing is about behavior change. Okay? There's an identified change goal. So MI involves a change goal. Now I mentioned three things that motivational interviewing is associated with. Listening, ambivalence, and behavior change or change. Okay? There's one thing I want you to keep in mind that MI is not associated with. And that is, and I'd like the typist to type this in as I say it, I want you to remember that MI is not psychotherapy. It can be therapeutic, but it's not psychotherapy. So if the typist would type in psychotherapy, or just therapy is fine too. Thank you. So you want to associate MI with listening, ambivalence and behavior change and you are not using MI to do psychotherapy. Now having said that, I want to add that motivational interviewing works very well with other techniques. As long as there's a behavior change goal, you can use motivational interviewing. You can use it in psychotherapy, you can use it in cognitive behavioral therapy, you can use it in insight oriented therapy, but there must be a change goal. Okay? Now the other thing I want you to take away in regard to MI, in addition to listening, ambivalence, and behavior change, is that motivational interviewing is an evidence-based practice. There is an actual evidence base that proves that motivational interviewing works. There's over 30 years of research. Now keep in mind, that's, that means that MI can be used, the data has shown that MI can be used over a broad range of problem areas. So originally motivational interviewing was researched in problem drinkers, but any behavior change, marijuana, other drugs of abuse, food issues, any kind of behavior change problem, MI, there's data that shows that it works there. It also, as I said, works well with other treatment methods. And the thing that's really important to keep in mind, I don't know how many people in the room are actually social workers or clinicians. One does not need to be a social worker or a clinician in order to practice, learn and practice motivational interviewing. Motivational interviewing can be used by a broad range of providers. Anybody that's helping people with behavior change can learn and practice motivational interviewing. So I've said this already, but I think it's important to just underline it, that motivational interviewing was originally discovered and developed during a clinical trial when working with problem drinkers. Uh, basically, uh, as this study was being conducted, it became clear based on the data that individuals responded better to workers who interacted with them in particular ways. And the researcher was able to identify what those behaviors actually were and began to explore them, write about them, and test them out. The one thing also to keep, or the additional things to keep in mind is that when you're talking about motivational interviewing, we said it was a client-centered form of communication and counseling. You cannot practice motivational interviewing unless you are using the work of Carl Rogers, who's an American psychologist who developed client-centered counseling. So you can be practicing motivation when you're practicing motivational interviewing, you are engaging in client-centered counseling. You can be engaging in client-centered counseling and not practicing motivational interviewing. You also can't really talk about motivational interviewing unless you talk about the work of Prochaska and Di Clemente in terms of their stages of change model, which was originally started for smoking cessation and found that 
basically it also applied to other behavior change. And again, some of you may be familiar with that, the uh, pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, maintenance, and relapse, the different stages of change. So again, when you're practicing motivational interviewing, you're also building on the foundation of the work of Prochaska and De Clemente, but you can be doing stage-oriented work and not practicing motivational interviewing. And as we go forward, I'm going to be very clear with you about what the difference is. The primary belief, though, to consider with motivational interviewing is that every client has the capacity and potential for change and adherence within them. They have an intrinsic ability to do this. If you can't believe this, you probably can't practice motivational interviewing. And this is called the Michelangelo belief, the belief that the statue of David was in the block of marble that Michelangelo got, and it took Michelangelo to tap and remove that intrinsic statue from the marble. So we have to believe that every client has the capacity and the potential for change in adherence. Okay? That's a pillar foundational belief to practice motivational interviewing. So I found this quote really interesting. And the thing that really sticks out to me about this quote is that the freedom to consider change. If there's nothing else you walk away from in terms of this webinar, and I hope there are many things you will, is I want you to walk away with this idea that our job when practicing motivational interviewing is to create an environment where the client feels accepted, where they can consider the idea of changing, as opposed to being told or directed to change. And the thing I like about this quote is that it really notes that acceptance is the key to creating this freedom to change. Now don't confuse acceptance with condoning. We accept that the person is who they are, is who they are, is doing what they're doing. They have value even if what they're doing is harmful to them. And we want to create an environment that accepts them and allows them the freedom to consider change. Because ultimately, when you think about it, folks, they're the ones that actually make the change, not us. They will make the change. We will help them to find the internal strengths to do that. And that's what motivational interviewing is about. So another way to think of motivational interviewing is that it's a way of helping people talk themselves into changing. So basically we use different tools, techniques, and skills to help them to talk about why they want to change, what tools and strengths they can bring to the change they want to make so that they can explore and resolve the ambivalence that they have about the change. Now the thing to keep in mind also is that ambivalence I want to change, I don't want to change, happening simultaneously is normal to the change process. Some workers will kind of panic when they hear somebody engaging in sustained talk. Well, I want to keep smoking because it's the way that I socialize with my friends. That's part, a normal part of the process of exploring ambivalence. Our job is to help them also to talk about these are some of the not so good things about smoking, and these are some of the benefits. So just keeping in mind that ambivalence is a normal part of the process of change, and we want to allow people to explore that and resolve it. So I want you to allow yourself to get quiet for a minute, and I'm gonna ask you to think a minute in your own imagination, in your mind, when you are at a wrestling match, what are some of the sounds you might hear? And again, I want you to just imagine those sounds for a minute. So just in your own mind, hear some of the sounds that you might hear if you were at a wrestling match. So again, you're kind of framing that in your own mind. And when we've done this in, in person, face to face, some people here talk about like grunting and people hitting the mat and the folding chair and bells going off and people 
sort of getting all riled up and excited. So those are some of the sounds that people talk about. Now I want you to think a minute about some of the sounds you might hear if two people were dancing. Some people have reported that they'd hear the music. They might hear sort of people sort of softly laughing. You might hear feet moving rhythmically on the floor. So just imagine some of those sounds for yourself. So when we think about motivational interviewing, we really want to think about dancing as opposed to wrestling. So if you find you're in a situation with a participant, client, patient, and you start to hear wrestling going on, stop. You want to think about motivational interviewing from the perspective of we want to tap what's inside that person already. We don't want to yank it or pull it out. We want to elicit from the person what their strengths are, how they succeeded in the past, what they think is the next right step, as opposed to imparting to them what they should be doing based on our vast experience. When you're engaging in a relationship in MI, you're consulting with the person. A consultant is an equal that's working with you in a partnership, as opposed to instructing. And we're guiding somebody toward their change goal, as opposed to telling them every step directing them what they should be do so should be doing so motivational interviewing is directional it's not directing it's guiding excellent so let's talk a little bit about MI spirit now I mentioned to you that I had gone to Wyoming to help build the house this is the back wall of the house made out of recycled tires the house that I was helping to build was called an earth ship which is a fully sustainable uh, off the power grid house that creates its own electricity through wind power and solar, manages its own water and sewage, and this was basically the back wall that surrounds the house that helps keep the heat in the house. I'm using this image because I want you to think about MI Spirit as sort of the surrounding environment that we create and that we use the tools of MI as we work with our clients. And basically, MI Spirit involves collaboration. We've already talked about that in terms of dancing, not wrestling. Acceptance, meaning that we've already talked about acceptance too, but let's be even a little more specific, that the client has autonomy to make the choices that are right for them. We also accept and honor their absolute worth as people. Affirmations are one of the tools that we use, so we want to affirm their strengths, their efforts, the fact that they showed up today. In fact, I'll give you an affirmation. I want to affirm all of you for attending this webinar tonight. We want to affirm and use affirmations when practicing motivational interviewing, and we also want to use accurate empathy, meaning we seek to understand the true meaning of the client by using open-ended questions to find out more about their experience. Also, motivational interviewing is about drawing out evocation, drawing out ideas and solutions from within the client as opposed to installing or imparting our ideas and our thoughts. And we also want to practice compassion, and we want to promote the client's welfare above our own. That's why we're doing this particular work, in addition to the paycheck that we collect. So there are four processes of motivational interviewing. What you're looking at now is actually the roof of the Earthship. So this is these four processes are the different steps and actions that we use the tools of MI to move through. All right? So another way that you can think of these are four steps. So if you think there's the first step that you have to walk up, the second step, third step, and the fourth step, and you walk up those steps and you get to the top, which is your change goal. All right? So let's move through those four steps. The first one is engaging. So that's the first step. We're always focusing on engaging, establishing a helpful connection in a working relationship. It's critical to do this at the very beginning, during intake. Now, intake can be a tricky time because there's certain demographic information, certain history that needs to be collected. 
don't rush to that before you work on engagement. So that's the first step. Then there's guiding. That there's a particular agenda that the client came to discuss, meaning a, an identified change goal. And again, as decided by the client. Then there's evoking. And this is when MI is uniquely MI. You can be practicing client-centered counseling. You can be using stages of change. But if you're not evoking the client's own motivation for change, you're not actually practicing motivational interviewing. Then there's planning, developing commitment to the change and forming a specific plan of action. Okay, so think of these as four steps. Now I'll tell you, the key trap that many people fall into is they move into planning right away. When they haven't spent enough time engaging, they haven't settled with the client on a particular change goal, and they're not actually practicing MI by evoking from the client what the client uh, has to bring to that change process, their strength and their intrinsic motivations. So again, this is um, another opportunity for a poll. In fact, I probably won't even launch it given how the other poll went, but I'll throw it out to you and I'm going to ask the typist to type in. So I'm going to go back to the four processes of motivational interviewing, which again are engaging, guiding, evoking, planning. And I want you to think for yourselves, which one of these is a process that would probably be something that you would want to focus on, that you would want to grow, so it would provide you with an opportunity to grow and practice when working with your clients. So call out which one of these processes would be most of a growth opportunity for you that you would like to bring into your work. So engaging, guiding, evoking, or planning. And if the typist uh, could please type some of those in, that would be helpful. So which one of these four would be one that you would really say, I want to focus on being able to engage better? And somebody just wrote in engaging. Somebody also just wrote in planning. Okay, engaging. A couple, we've got two engagings. Oh, somebody wrote in evoking too. That was the first one. Okay, so evoking, planning, engaging. Excellent. So I ask you to do this because probably the best way to learn motivational interviewing, there are really two things. One is, is practicing and mastering ORs, the core skills, and then simply practicing using the skills. So if you're clear, I want to focus on learning how to evoke, you're going to be able to think through that and practice that with your clients, and you'll be able to bring that to supervision as well. Excellent. So change talk. It's really, you know, this is a very condensed version of an MI training, but I really felt it was important that we focus a little bit on change talk. So when you think about change talk, it's any speech, because remember we said MI was associated with listening, ambivalence, and behavior change. It's not psychotherapy, so it's not associated with that. It can be used with psychotherapy, but it's not psychotherapy. So change talk is any speech, and we're listening for that speech, that favors movement in the direction of change linked to a particular behavior change target or change goal. Okay, So it's important in this brief overview for you to walk away with this idea of change talk is what we're listening for. Anything that the client says that favors movement in the direction of change. And again, linked to a particular behavior change target. You know, I'm going to give you an example. You know, <clears throat> I wake up in the morning and I find I'm hacking and I'm coughing for the first 15 minutes until I light up that first cigarette. That would be an example of change talk. Now, if a client said that to me, I would use a tool of reflection. And I would say, when you wake up in the morning, you cough and hack for the first 15 minutes before you smoke your cigarette. And that would be using a tool of reflection so that the client hears that you heard them. And when you give it back to them in a reflection, they hear it themselves, possibly in a way that they didn't prior to your giving it back to them, prior to your reflecting it back to them. So now let's focus on the core skills, ORs. ORs is an acronym. O is for open-ended questions, A is for affirmations, R is for reflections, and S 
is for summarizing statements, okay? Or summarizing listening and statements. So open-ended questions, affirmations, reflective listening, summarizing listening or summarizing statements. So these are the four tools. After this webinar, my hope is that all of you will use any practice opportunities that you have with your clients, supervision with each other to practice these skills. Asking open-ended questions, giving affirmations, using reflections, and summarizing listening. If you simply practice these skills with further practice, you can really uh, use MI in a very in a very effective way. So here's a little opportunity that we're going to have now to practice listening carefully for these skills. Can anybody, by the way, identify what this is a picture of? And I chose this picture specifically because we're now going down into sort of the area of safe practice skills. So does anybody know what this is a picture, where this picture is from? And feel free to call it out and the typist will type it in. Does anybody know where this is a picture from? It is, yes, it's a cave. All right, so thumbs up to that person. Which cave does anybody know? And then I have a follow-up extra credit question if anybody knows which cave. I will add that I have been to this particular cave on, I believe now, four occasions. Okay, so you don't know. This is Carlsbad Caverns, and uh, I recommend it highly. And again, I felt it was an appropriate image as we go into our skills practice. So let me bring this up. And what I'm going to ask is that you all play the provider and I will play the client. There are two versions of this. There's version one and there's version two. So when I say go, I want you all out loud to read together the provider line. I will then say the client line and then I'd like you to read the provider line and I will say the client line. So just somebody type in for me, do you understand the instructions, yes or no? Excellent. So what I'm going to do is I will say go, and I want you to, and hopefully the timing will work here, because I can't hear you, but I'm, I'll give it a little pause, and I will say the client line, and then I want you to give me the provider line, and then I'll give you the client line. So we'll do version one, we'll do version two, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so just give me a yes if you're, if you're in agreement on that. Excellent. So, go with the provider line. Well, sort of, yes. Yeah, I know, you're right. I know. It's not that easy to make it happen right now. Besides, I feel okay. I'm not sick. Okay, so how did the, did the timing work out okay? Was it okay or not okay? Okay, good. So, so everybody heard that. Everybody said it, hopefully. Now let's move on to the next one. So that was version one. That was the scenario. We're going to do the same scenario again, but we're going to hear it a slightly different way. Here we go, version two. And again, I'll give you the go. Go. I never made it. I don't like doctors. They don't treat people with respect, always answering the phone and typing at their computers instead of looking at you. Yes. She used words I didn't understand. I felt stupid. She didn't explain the words, and I didn't feel like I could ask. She would have found out I didn't understand what she was talking about.
Okay, so the timing work out okay with that? Okay, not so okay? Okay, so folks, we just went through both of those together. Now, using the type phrase, the type section, please throw out comments to the typist. Do you notice differences between version 1 and version 2? And if you notice differences, be specific. What are the differences? So go ahead and share that with the typist, and, and then we'll, we'll walk through these as we go. So what did you notice that was different from version 1 and version 2? And I know it may take a minute or two to sort of type some of these responses in. So, so I'm, I'm patiently awaiting your responses. Version 2 gave more information. Yes, that's true. Who gave more information in version 2? Version 2, the client seemed more agitated. Okay, yeah. What else? Version 2, provider seemed to have cared. Very well observed. What did the provider do that implied that they cared? Yes. The provider turned down the phone ringer, encouraged the client uh, for being there, absolutely. So that would be basically creating an MI spirited environment, a client centered environment, and it would also be an affirmation. Showed concern, absolutely. So again, that's about the acceptance. Good, so you're really observing this. Good. What else did you observe? What did the worker say and do that was different in version 2 than version 1. Sure. Any did you notice any other differences from version 1 and version 2? Yes, he reflected absolutely and he listened. Yep, or she, he or she, we don't know what gender the provider was. Um, yeah, okay. So there was definitely listening going on. Now I'm going to ask another question. Um, he made the client feel okay. Can wh Whoever said that, can you say more about that? How did the worker make the client feel okay? What did the worker do? Any other responses in regard to that, or should we move on? By listening to him, when the provider states, sounds like you were uncomfortable, yes. I, and I really appreciate that whoever shared that answer is listening very carefully to what the provider said because the provider reflected something that basically reflected a feeling 
that they were getting from the client. That's probably the most advanced form of reflection when you reflect the feeling. And you'll notice the client reflected it. You seem a bit nervous as opposed to saying, are you nervous? There's a difference. There's a difference between a reflection and a question. So whoever, whoever made that comment, that was, that's very well observed. All of the comments are very well observed. Uh-huh. Excellent. So let's go back to version one for a minute. And I want to ask a qu one question about that. In version one, who was running the session? The provider, yes. Now, what was the difference in who was running the session in version two? Yes, it was more of a collaboration. Excellent. Again, I know it's a very simple activity, but I'm really glad that you're able to observe the subtleties in that. Now, before we move on, I want to ask one more question. In terms of our doing this activity together, you know, I read a line, you read a line. Did you all read the lines out, li out loud together? Excellent. Good job. Thank you. I, I'm really glad that you did that. Um, and again, it's clear to me that you were listening very closely based on what you were hearing and what you were reading. So thank you. And basically, we just did what you, uh, what you, uh, what this slide says. So, and I'm only mentioning these cacti because these were at Carl's Bad Caverns when I was there, and the. I think the third time I was there, they had had a terrible, terrible fire, and all the uh, all the plants had been burned pretty severely. So I took several pictures of it, and I thought I'd share one of those with you as well. So, as we start to come to the end of the webinar, and I'm I'm also going to you know I want to open it up for more questions, um, as you know because we have time. But I want to uh, I want to throw out a couple of other ideas. First and foremost is that the interpersonal relationship that you have with your client is probably your most powerful tool. Now, let me make a distinction here. This does not mean your best buds with your client or your participant. It simply means that you're working using the different skills and tools you have to build an interpersonal relationship with your client. Now, asking permission shows respect and sets the stage for collaboration. Somebody noted in the feedback that you gave about version two that there was a collaboration going on. In fact, I think that was the last bit of feedback. Version two was more of a collaboration. And I'm going to just scroll back to that for a minute because I want to point out this bottom line. Can I tell you about some of the doctors I work with in our program? Question mark. Now, let's think about that a minute because we may know a lot of great information that we want to tell our clients. And we may think, oh, they've come here for this information, so it's my job to tell them this information. What I want to encourage you to do, and this is one thing I'd really like you to try and practice after this webinar, is when you go back to your clients and you feel the desire to share what you know with that client, and they haven't asked you directly, now, if they've asked you directly, that's a different thing. But if they haven't asked you directly and you feel the impulse, the desire, the need to share information with them, I'm going to ask you to experiment and try asking them permission before you do it. So can I tell you about some of the doctors I work with in our program? If you ask that and you ask that sincerely of the client, you're honoring their autonomy to decide whether they want this information or not. So I just throw that out there as something for you to consider about asking permission. And again, I want to link it to this slide, which is asking permission shows respect and it sets the stage for collaboration. So 
before we go to the last couple of slides, um, I want to open it up at this particular point and say, are there any comments or reactions or questions at this particular point that you want to throw out in the question window that perhaps I can respond to before I leave you with a few final thoughts? And I know that may take a minute. Uh, no questions or concerns. Okay. So having said that then, before we go to the final couple of slides, I want to go backward a minute to version one. Now, if you look at that first line, wow, I didn't expect to see you today. I hear you missed your doctor's appointment last week. If somebody said that to you and you were the client, how do you think you might feel? And again, throw that out to the typist and we can sort of we can sort of look at what your reactions might be. And again, I'm asking you, if somebody said that to you and you were the client, how do you think you might feel? Demoralized? Anything else? How else do you think? Offended? Yes. What else? Interrogated, absolutely, absolutely. So folks, what did we just say, not listening, that the person really wasn't listening? Okay, what else? These are, these are I, again, I really appreciate you looking at how you would feel in regard to that. Demoralized, offended, interrogated, not listening, okay? Any other responses in regard to that, how you think you might feel? Failure. You might feel like a failure. Absolutely. Now, if that was the case and you were feeling any of those things won't be helped. Yes, that, you, that the person won't help you. Absolutely. So if you were feeling any of those things, how likely would it be that you'd want to come back to work with this worker? Not likely, absolutely. So that communicates that one line, that's one line, and that communicates something very powerful to this client. Now, I want to go down to the bottom line. You don't have to make it happen. I made the appointment for you. All you have to do is show up. How do you think you might feel if a worker said that to you? Presumptuous, yes. What else? You don't have to make it happen. I made the appointment for you. All you have to do is show up. I've made it so easy for you. How do you think you might feel? Take away their choice, yes. And again, I really appreciate the way that's framed. Take away their choice, because what did we say? Part of MI spirit is respecting the autonomy of the client, their choice about whether they want to make an appointment or not make an appointment. Absolutely. So again, here's the final question in regard to version one, and I want you to all weigh in on this, which is that how likely or how close to real life do you think this conversation in version one actually is? You think it, it, it actually could happen in real life, or do you think it's just sort of um, not very likely? Could happen. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So just important to keep in mind that it happens too much, somebody writes. Okay. All right. Or somebody said. Absolutely. All right. So let's go now to this last idea. But before we go to this last idea, I'm going to ask everybody to do a self-rating. Okay? And I'm going to ask the typist to type in everybody's number. Okay? So on a scale of 1 to 10, 
one being not likely at all, and 10 being absolutely I will, how likely is it that you will use some of what was covered in this webinar in your work going forward? One, not likely at all, 10, yes I will. So we have one 10, I have a second 10, I have another 10, I have another 10, I have another 10, okay. Lots of tens in the room. I got a three, so so not so not so likely. Got another ten. Ten. Any other numbers? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that's ten people have responded. Okay. Got a seven. Got a ten. Got a ten. Got a ten. Okay. I got a nine. All right, got a five, got a four, excellent. Got an eight, excellent. Again, I really appreciate you all giving your honest assessment. Now, I can't see who these assessments are from, so I, I'm not putting anyone on the spot. I wanna ask a question to the person who gave themselves a seven, okay? And this question is specifically for you. The person who gave yourself a seven, the, I hear that you, you rated yourself a seven, can you say a little bit about why you didn't rate yourself a six? And if the typist could just type that in. You rated yourself a seven. I see that you've given yourself a seven. Why didn't you rate yourself a six? Don't work closely with clients, okay? So, I have pride, okay, all right, okay, so you have pride, uh-huh. The same person, you rated yourself a seven, what would help you to move to an eight in terms of using what was in this webinar in your work? What would help you to move to an eight? Excellent, more client interaction. Okay, so the opportunity to practice and have more contact with clients would help you to move from a seven to an eight. So I wanna just say thank you very much for giving those responses. And again, it was not my intention to put you on the spot. So thank you very much for sharing that information. And I would like us all to give the person who gave that response a round of applause. And I'll do a gentle one over here. Thank you, thank you very much. So hopefully you're all clapping over there too. And I'll leave you with these two thoughts. And I, and I get a note that you're applauding. Thank you. People are greatly better persuaded by their reasons which they have themselves discovered than by those which have come into the minds of others. This to me is such a powerful quote to end this webinar on because MI is about helping people talk themselves into changing. People are much more likely to move toward their change and accomplish it if they're coming up with the ways to do that. MI is a tool to help people to reach and attain their change goal. So it's been a real pleasure to be with you all tonight. Thank you very much.